right, folks, this is our first lecture of the semester. Um, this is Module 1, the very first chapter and all. So we're just going to dive right into the content. This is uh, kind of the introductory material that you'll need to kind of carry with you through the rest of the semester. We're going to start that. That's Unit 1. Um, and then uh, once we get into Unit 2 material, that's when our macro and micro classes diverge and become uh, very separate content. Um, but for this uh, first unit, which consists of the first five chapters, uh, there will be a discussion, uh, or I should say the content overlaps from macro and micro. All right. So um, when we start talking about the economy, we have to acknowledge that we simply do not have enough for everybody to get everything they want. All right, we call this scarcity. All right, and this just simply means there's not enough resources to satisfy all of our wants. All right, every society, every level, we have to make choices about how we use those resources, and every single choice we make has a consequence. There's a trade-off. There's an opportunity cost. We call it opportunity cost is what we give up when we choose one thing over another. So if we choose to take this money and spend it over here, uh, then uh, that's money you don't have to spend elsewhere. Um, there's an opportunity cost for you to take this class. What else could you be doing right now? Perhaps you are behind on your sleep. You could study for other classes. A very common opportunity cost for having taken a class like this is the foregone income you could be earning uh, on a job right now. Instead, you're sitting here at your computer watching me. Sorry. All right. Uh, the, this textbook defines economics as the study of the trade-offs and choices that we make um, given scarcity. Uh, that's a fine definition. My preferred de definition is as follows. Economics is the study of how we choose to allocate our limited resources to meet our unlimited wants. In economics, we talk about economic resources, also known as productive resources, also known as factors of production. So let's distinguish uh, between different types of goods to start with. The economic goods are those goods that we have to pay to obtain. Um, you might hear reference, refer, these referred to as scarce goods. The more scarce they are, the more you generally have to pay to have them. All right? Then there are those free goods. Those are the things that you can obtain for free because they're so abundant relative to their demand. Oxygen, for example, is a free good. All right? Then there are those productive resources, and these are really important. All right? These are the inputs used in the production of goods and services. There are four of them. Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Productive resources. Economic resources, factors of production, all mean the same thing. I've moved my uh, uh, video image up there to prevent it from blocking some of this information. Four of them, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. Land is not simply the dirt beneath your feet. Land are the natural resources used in the production of goods and services. Trees, plants, wind, sun, water, all of those things are natural resources that can be used in some productions. Okay, Capital. They refer to it as economic capital in this textbook. I learned it of it as physical capital. Either one's fine. And it's important that you understand, because we need to make a distinction between this kind of capital and other forms of capital we'll talk about in a moment. So if land are the natural resources used in the production of goods and services, economic or physical capital are those uh, human-made tools used in the production of goods and services. Wrench, uh, factory equipment, trucks... All of those are considered physical or economic capital. Okay, Now, the reason why we make the distinction between economic or physical capital and financial capital is because financial capital is not in and of itself productive. It is made more productive by through the purchase of physical capital. But it, money itself is not typically traditionally been considered its own uh, resource in terms of factors of production. Um, and that's kind of almost sort of maybe changing a little bit um, in, in economic circles, but it's it's the case now. All right. All right. So um, then there's labor, and this is the human effort, the, the human effort put into production of goods and services. It's both the physical effort, but it's also the intellectual effort. It's your knowledge and understanding. There's a special name for that, right? It's called human capital. The skills and knowledge you bring to the labor market, referred to as capital, human capital, excuse me. And human capital is forms the basis of determining your worth 
to the labor market, not your worth as a human being. I'm not talking about that. I just simply mean this is how it is determined how much you should get away. If you want to understand why folks who work in fast food restaurants aren't paid a lot of money, this is why. Because the human capital necessary to drop a basket of fries and hot grease just isn't uh, that that significant. No, no, don't misunderstand me. Trust me, I've dropped plenty, plenty of hot fries and hot grease over my the course of my life. I've worked in many fast food restaurants. I don't think there's any I haven't worked at at some point. So, uh, but that that's that's how we typically evaluate the value of labor of your labor. What's your human capital? Presumably, that's why you're in this class, right? You're expanding your human capital. Okay? So labor is the physical effort, the intellectual effort. We, we bundle that all together into one. But a subcomponent of labor is this idea of human capital. Okay? And then again, there's entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the ability, presumably an entrepreneur, to recognize an opportunity and organize land, labor, and capital toward the production uh, of that good or service that they think may be profitable and included with that one of the reasons why we believe entrepreneurs should be justly rewarded is because they're the ones who have to accept the risk involved and believe me there's a great deal of risk involved in starting a business most businesses fail i've heard it as high in the first five to ten years of uh working most small businesses uh 75 percent of small businesses fail in the first 10 years um i think that comes from the small business uh, association so if you want to look that up so let's talk more about this idea of opportunity cost. Again, this is the value of the next best alternative. Every single choice we make as a society, every single choice you make as an individual has a consequence, has an opportunity cost. There is, you're, you're giving up something. There's simply not enough resources, time, money, knowledge. There's simply not enough of that to do everything you want to do. And you have to make choices. You had to, you know, individually, um, uh, recognizing those opportunity costs can affect which choice you make. I mean, at some, at least at some subconscious level, surely we all do that, right? We all evaluate every choice we make in life in terms of what, are, what am I not going to be able to do for this? Now, you may not consciously think of it that way. Every choice you make has a consequence. In economics, that consequence is known as the opportunity cost. Okay? Then there are societal decisions, as I said. And this, for example, universal health care. Great idea. I, th I think that idea comes from a, a good place. But there's an opportunity cost associated with that. Can we do that and have more housing? Can we do that and enforce environmental regulations? Can we do that and provide for national defense? All right. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about specialization towards the end of the semester when we really talk about uh, comparative advantage and absolute advantage in terms of trading with other countries. Um, and this was something that a, a famous philosopher, really, by the name of uh, Adam Smith, he published a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations. It's a rather, rather dense tomb. I have one back behind me here. Um, uh, and it's, he talks a lot about division and specialization when it comes to labor. Division of labor, and, and, and this is how Ford created uh, such an effective production line. Each person on that production line focused, specialized in one thing, and they did that. And so all the tasks involved in building a car could be broken down into discrete tasks, each individual one. This person focused on this task only. This person only on this task. This person only on this task, and so forth and so on. And in that, they got to specialize. So the division of labor is how the work required to produce a good or service is divided into these tasks that get performed by individual workers. And specialization is when a worker or a firm focus on those tasks for which they are best suited within the overall production process, and they specialize in that. They get really good at that because that's what they've been doing. Okay? And it creates greater efficiency. All right? Um, and the reason why division of labor increases production and efficiency, anytime you increase uh, economic efficiencies, chances are production's going up. That's, that's really what you're talking about there, right? 
And so one of the reasons for that is because you begin to achieve at some point the econ what we call economies of scale. This is when the average cost of producing an individual unit declines as total output increases, right? For example, Walmart, Amazon, they have economies of scale. So Walmart, for example, if we were to suddenly raise corporate taxes really high to 50 to 60%, Walmart could, could absorb a little bit more of that. They could also pass it on to us by own. Just think, imagine for a second. How many uh, individual items do you think there are in a average Walmart store? How many Walmart stores are there around the world? So if they raised the cost of every single thing it sold by, say, half a penny, how much money would that raise? You know what I'm saying? That's economies of scale. They can distribute it, the cost, that's additional cost, across so many goods and services that you will hardly even notice. That will cut significantly. Uh, if they don't do it, it will cut significantly into their profit. But for you and I, it would hardly be felt. It's just a, a half penny addition, a penny more for everything we buy. But because they have so much to buy and there's so many places to go buy it, They've got economies of scale. Same with Amazon. And any really large, multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation, they're going to have economies of scale at some at some level. All right. Um, as I said, we'll talk about trade in detail towards the end of the semester. The last couple of chapters are going through foreign exchange and international trade, global economy. Um, but, so... Uh, here, what we're talking about is, that, is the fact that specialization can only make sense if our workers can use their income to purchase what they're making. Um, this is what Ford recognized when he was producing his uh, Model T back in the uh, early part of last century, is that it doesn't do any good to make these cars if nobody can afford them. And this really kind of launched the advent of consumer credit which helped lead to the huge downturn in the late 20s throughout the 30s and really going into the, the mid to late 40s. So we'll talk more about trade and specialization in a later date. So now we need to get, make the distinction between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Macroeconomics focuses on broad issues such as growth, unemployment, inflation, trade. It's the big issues. It's basically taking... Um, Households, workers, businesses, markets in aggregate, all together. And it does not have to be global or national or state. You can look at the macro economy of your neighborhood. If it's more than one household you're counting, you're doing a macroeconomic analysis there. If it's only one household, that's where you get into microeconomics, right? That focuses on the actions of particular agents within the economy. One household. One kind of worker one kind of business, one kind of market, right? Um, and in microeconomics, that's where you talk about the theory of consumer behavior, of firm behavior. You get more involved in that. Um, in macroeconomics, you're talking about growth, uh, unemployment, inflation, trade balance, um, all of those things. And, and um, of the two, if you're only going to take one, I would recommend macroeconomics if you're really wanting an understanding of the economy. Um if you're a business major, you're going to do both in, in sequence. And I never know, you know, some of the students have already had micro and they're taking macro now. Some of the students have already had macro and they're taking micro. And some people are in their first year of the two course sequence, their first course of the two course sequence. So for that reason, that's why we have this overlapping unit here where the content is the same in both micro and macro. Okay. All right. So that's micro and macro. Uh, so when you're talking about microeconomics, um, here are some questions you might ask that are related to microeconomics. What determines how households and individuals spend their budgets? What combination of goods and services will best fit their needs and wants, given the budget they have to spend? How do people decide whether to work? And if so, full-time, part-time, temporary, contract? How do we do that? How do people decide how much to save for the future? or whether they should borrow to spend now. All right. Uh, how about uh, what determines products and how many of each a firm should produce? That's a micro question. What determines how much a firm will charge? We'll get into that. That's part of unit one, supply and demand. What determines how a firm will produce its product? 
what determines how many workers it's going to hire. Uh, how does it finance its business? When will a firm expand, downsize, or close? Macroeconomics breaks down policy goals into one of two categories. Monetary policy, which is set by the Fed, not the government, but the Federal Reserve. We'll talk about that detail in our macro class. Um, and it's about changing interest rates. With, with, it's about affecting the supply of money to change interest rates. And interest rates are the cost of borrowing money. If interest rates goes up, it costs more to borrow money. You borrow less money. That's going to cut back on activity. It's primarily going to affect business spending, to be frank. Um, but consumer spending can be affected, too. Uh, and then there's fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is government. It's legislative. And it consists of one or two things. It's either changing government spending or it's changing tax rates. So monetary policy is the Federal Reserve Bank and it's changing the supply of money to affect interest rates. Okay, which affects the availability of credit, which can cut back on borrowing. And people who borrow are going to spend it. You're not going to borrow money and save it. That doesn't make any sense. Um, fiscal policy is government, legislated. It requires a law get passed. Um, and it's about government spending and taxes. I'm not sure what happened here. This, so there's an overview of kind of what we're going to be looking at, in some, uh, in, particularly in the macro class, but uh, to a lesser extent in, in our macro class. How do we do this? How do we, how do we take students from virtually no understanding, or even worse, a complete misunderstanding of the economy, and a lot of you have a complete misunderstanding of, the, of economics. I'm sorry, but you do. I hope to help fix those. Uh, you be the judge of how effective I am, um, and call me out when I'm wrong. Um, or if you think I'm wrong, I'm happy to have those conversations with you. Please. Um, how, so how do we take students from having no understanding or limited understanding or bad understanding of the economy to turn them into better consumers, if you will, better consumers of economic data and information? We use models, and there's going to be quite a bit of those, right? The, the biggest one is supply and demand. In macroeconomics, we'll expand on supply and demand in something called the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. But we'll get there. So a model is nothing more than a simplified version of reality that allows us to, to observe, understand, and make predictions about economic behavior. Economic models allow us to represent things um, uh, with words and mathematics. All right, this is the circular flow model. This is just one example of an economic model that we use. It is a diagram indicating that the economy consists of Households, you can see them here, and firms, and they interact in a factors market here and in a goods market here. So firms pay for labor primarily, but other factors as well. All right. So um, they pay for wages, salaries, and benefits for your labor. You use that money to buy goods and services, which they use to produce goods and services. There's your circular flow. All right? The labor market down here, or the resource market, really, is where households sell labor and other resources, economic resources, productive resources, to firms or other uh, employees. All right? Uh, and then there's the goods and services market up here. We, this, we call this the factors market oftentimes, and this is the product market, I should say. Uh, but that's good. This, this is fine the way they have. Now, it's a very simplified version of our economy. In fact, it's missing some very key ingredients, if you ask me. Anybody notice anything missing from this model? Where's the government? That's a pretty big element in our economy, isn't it? How about the financial institutions, banks and the like? Where are they at? How about international trade? We were just talking about specializa specialization. Where's that at? Well, you know, let's go take a look. That's what it would look like. That's an expanded version of the circular flow. I suspect one of the reasons why economists like this model is because it is scalable. We can keep it very simple, and we can scale it up to really make it a much more complicated model. Here we've got government. We've got financial markets. 
All right, here's the government up here. Here's financial markets down here. And here's our global trade right there. Okay, so this is a much more complicated version of the same model. Those are the kind of models we like, those that are scalable, that we can do additional things with as we learn more about the economy. All right. All right, so that's models. Let's talk about functions. A function is a relationship or expression involving one or more variables. In economics, functions usually describing uh, a causal relationship, cause and effect. Um, the variable on the left is often the, the effect, and the variable on the right is the cause. So economic models tend to express relationships using economic variables, such as your budget equals money spent on economics textbooks plus money spent on music. It's very simple. Right? That's one. That's a function. Remember, whatever you're doing the math, order of operations. PEMDAS. Parentheses. Exponents. Multiplication and division. Addition and subtraction. Okay? The most common equation you're going to see is in the form of a line. You should be fairly familiar with this. Uh, I've always seen it as y equals mx plus b, but that's okay. They have the constant first. Nothing wrong with that. y equals b plus mx, same thing. m is the slope. b is the y-intercept. All right? Um, variables is a quantity that can assume a range of values represented by a letter or symbol, like y equals 9 plus 3x. Both x and y are variables in there. All right, and now we have graphs. Many of our models, we use graphs to represent them more than we use functions, to be frank. But there's a few of those, too. There's the intercept, which is the point of the graph where a line crosses the vertical or horizontal exit. Here's your y-intercept. Here's the x-intercept. Then there's the slope, right? Rise over run, right? Here's the rise over run. Right? How much did it increase upwards versus how much did it increase or decrease uh, to the left or right? Okay, rise over run. Variable is a quantity that can assume a range of values. X-axis is your horizontal axis, and Y-axis is your vertical axis. This is straight Cartesian coordinate system. Nothing new here. Um, there's that Y equals MX plus B. M is the slope. B is the Y-intercept. Generally, that's the equation of a line. So the slope is nothing more than a change in the vertical axis divided by a change in the horizontal axis. Right? So rise over run. It's important that you understand the difference between a positive relationship and a negative relationship. Um, a positive or a direct relationship indicates that the two variables are positively related. When one variable increases, the other variable increases, and vice versa. All right? If the value of y is increasing, the value of x is increasing. That's a positive relationship because they moved in the same direction. Okay? But sometimes we have a... Uh, downward slope, all right? Um, and it, when that happens, now we have what we call a negative or an inverse or indirect relationship between the two variables. As the value of y is increasing, the value of x is decreasing or vice versa. They are negatively related. Here's a zero slope, all right? Uh, this just means that the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the horizontal axis is zero. Um, and if it's perfectly uh, vertical, then it will be in uh, infinity, because you can't divide by a zero. So if it's perfectly vertical, you remember it's rise over run. So the rise here is zero divided by the run. So if you go from here to here or whatever, it's not going to matter. It's still going to be a, a zero, because any, any of these numbers divided into zero is zero. But if it's perfectly vertical, then when you do that, um, rise... It's going up. It's a vertical line now. Um, but there is no run. So it's whatever, how, you know, 10 or a million, doesn't matter, divided by zero. And you can't divide by zero. That's why we call it infinite or uh, undefined. All of that's relevant. Uh, and we'll talk about that primarily in Chapter 5 when we start talking about elasticities towards the end of this unit. Um, it's a... You've done this before. There's not. We're not going to be doing a lot of this directly, but some, in some ways, we will. So we'll skip through that. You can look through that on your own time. Okay. And then, you know, most relationships are, in fact, nonlinear. And you'll find that out if you ever take any other economics courses, for sure. All right. Not going to spend a lot of time talking about this part here. There will be line graphs. This is something you'll see a lot in the textbook. All right. Uh, it's a relationship between two variables. 
and then here's another linear graph right there okay and and you you have to you're going to need to be able to kind of interpret data uh in, in both the in word form and in graphical form this is data in graphical form right here so you have pie charts that's a very common uh, graphical representation of data right uh, this is a pie graph that shows how U.S. population was divided among children, working age adults, and the elderly in different times, 1970, 2000, and 2030. This uh, is a continuation of the same pie chart. Bar graphs is another way of representing data. It's a very common way. Uh, it's it's just a, takes a pie chart in a different way, really. Um, and you can stack bar graphs like you have here, or you can put them side by side like you have here. All right. Um, and uh, this is uh, always a good way. And this is uh, uh, bars for separate age groups, bars showing the total population divided into age groups, and the bars showing the total population divided into percentages. You can still use bar graphs for percentages, but a pie chart would work just as well for this one. Okay. So how do how do you know? Um, so like I said, this is usually best to show how a group is divided. This many, this percentage, this percentage, this, percentage, this many, twenty students. 40 students in this class, 30 students in this class, 15 students in this class. That's another way. Um, but bar graphs are especially useful when you're comparing quantities and you're wanting to know which one is bigger. Sometimes a pie slice doesn't always tell the picture the way a, a, a bar graph can. Okay, so uh, it's really preference. Line graphs are the most effective for illustrating a relation between two variables. That's why we use it in supply and demand. Okay, there's a nice quick review here, certainly in the book. I would encourage you to bring that up. Um, remember, these PowerPoint slides are readily available to you on our Canvas course page, so I would encourage you to, uh, to use those. Uh, regardless, I will see you for the next lecture. Thanks.